It's not about pedigree. It's not about polishedness. It's not about what school you came from and who you know. It's about old fashioned grit and resiliency and street smarts. I have an ego. You have to have an ego. I'm a person that was president of my company, the number two person in my company, you know, for a long time. You know, when people show you who they are, like believe them. Billy, I am so excited for this. I heard so many good things from Rana when I was walking with her in the park. I was like, I want to have Billy on the show. Please make the intro. So grateful to her for doing so. And thank yeah. you for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. Rana is amazing. I want to tell you, Harry, I think this is like, like maybe like a bucket list thing for me to do with you because I've been watching, you know, your growing kind of YouTube presence. And um, I was hoping to get the invite. And sometimes you get lucky and actually get it. Do you know so what? Thanks to you and Rana. I remember when we started, I could actually get away with not doing video. And now I actually have to look presentable, Billy. I mean, this well, is a tiring life. More than presentable. I think you're ready for, um, you know, the bigger, the, the biggest platform available. Well, you're very kind. Charm will get you a long way. But I want to go back way, way back, which is I think we're shaped actually a lot in our childhood. And so if we go back to your early years, how would your parents and teachers have described the young Billy and what? I, that I, I do agree with your premise that like it's amazing, you know, how how much of you gets formed from like the age of like zero to six or zero to eight. If you had known me then, I think maybe there are parts of me that would, um, you know, not surprise you and maybe some parts that would surprise you. So I think I was like a much more quiet kid. Um, and I think I've become a, a fairly um you know boisterous um i'm not a young adult anymore i think i'm like middle-aged now believe it or not <laughs> harry um but i was a quiet kid and what i would say maybe um in a more interesting way um i tended to do very well in school at things that i was interested in and very poorly in things that i was not interested in so i was like almost like that prototypical um, kid that flourished when I was engaged on something and then really struggled, like capital S struggled when it was not interesting to me. There's like a story about, you know, the kid that took French from like zero, you know, to 11th grade and couldn't learn to speak like three sentences in French. And then he moves to Paris, meets a girl who only speaks French and learns the language in like two months. I was kind of like that. You know, as soon as I was emotionally kind of engaged on a topic, then I would do OK. But I struggled with everything that was um, sort of like not straightforward to me. I was not like by any stretch. I was no Rana. I was I was no, um, you know, no straight A student by any stretch. Did you have a hard first job? Uh, someone said to me the other day, uh, it's very transformative to have a really hard first job, be it like doing lawn mowing when you were seven all day or like doing paper rounds. Did you have that? I did. Work? I mean, I, you know, I grew up in Manhattan, like, like, you know, so there were no lawns to mow. <laughs> um, but I'm going to make you laugh with this because, because I'm sometimes like the, the, it's a good question. Sometimes like the most true stories are kind of like entertaining. My first job and it was like, um, you know, for sure, um, either end of high school or kind of early college, kind of one of those summer jobs, was working, Harry, at a place they called like OTBs. It was it was uh, off-track betting, um, a place where people would go in back in the 80s and 90s in Manhattan and place bets on horses. And I was a, a betting clerk um, in, in the South Bronx, um, which was, um, it still is, a, it was, it's, a, it's a tough neighborhood. And it was a tough job and you had to learn very quickly to think on your feet. Um, you met all different types of people. Um, it wasn't, um, it wasn't like an internship at, um, you know, Brown brother, Brown brothers or Morgan Stanley. It was the school of the school of a little bit of the school of hard knocks. You said about kind of earlier that you're kind of really leaned into things that you were good at or passionate about and discarded or didn't like the things that you didn't. Yeah. Do you think people should lean into their strengths and discard their weaknesses? I think that there's a way maybe to like overdo all of that. And maybe there was a time when I was a, you know, when I was a kid where I was definitely overdoing it. There's something about like, you know, the three C minuses and the and the two A's that doesn't always please the parents, plus it can cause some alarm bells in the school. So I wouldn't necessarily pattern all of that. That, that being said, I think, especially as you get older, I think there are you know, inherent strengths 
that you want to kind of lean into. Um, there are things that like you're good at, the things that you gravitate to. But most importantly, I think there is an aspect of, you know, what what are you really ultimately emotionally engaged in? Like, what do you really truly care about? And then my instinct is you tend to do the best with things that you really care about. I love it. Someone said to me the other day, everyone says like, do what you love. I say that's bullshit. They say, uh, do what you're good at, because what you're good at, you'll generally like. And if you don't, suck it up. (laughs) I I think that's true. It's a little bit of you can you can be misleading when it's sort of like, you know, just follow your passion, Harry. Just do what you love. You know, life can be a little more kind of exacting. And sometimes, you know, decisions you make early in your career, early in your life have like longer term consequences. So you can be sometimes I think you can be a little naive if you just go down that path. What's the that sort of Hemingway? Like, isn't it pretty to think so? <laughs> like, wouldn't it be nice if we could all just do like things that we love? You're a P- <laughs> you're a you're a PM way back, weren't you? I, I had um I had a couple of jobs in the old kind of traditional world. I was a bond broker and then a um a sort of sell side bond trader. Okay. And when you think um, about kind of working, learning, learning along the way, I was never like, never good at it. I think maybe that's because I didn't like it. Did you find being CEO very natural? It is a very different role. Every CEO ship is different. There are aspects of the job that I have found to be natural. And there are aspects of the job um, that I think I gravitate towards and I enjoy. Um, and then there are kind of things about it that I think maybe aren't like in my perfect sweet spot and are harder. What do you what do you think makes a good CEO? Like, what are the core checklist of my job as CEO? Is this? I'm like not going to make you laugh with this, but I, I do think there's something which is interesting, which is like, you're the CEO of a company, and what is a company? It's like people. So I I do constantly kind of remind myself that I'm dealing with people, and people have egos, they have opinions, they have personalities. There are ways to sort of motivate people the right way, and then you can demotivate people. So I do think there's a concept of like remind yourself what a company is. Um, I think high level, you have to be the external face of the company, and you have to really be the person that at the end of the day represents the company at the highest level. I think you have to set strategy. And I, and I say that like in a, in a very straightforward way. I think it's the CEO's responsibility to set the strategic direction of a company. Mm-hmm. And then the company executes behind that. I try to, I think in a good way, I try to get my kind of sleeves rolled up and my hands around execution. Because I do think that's where companies kind of ultimately make their bones around like, how good are you at really ultimately executing on a game plan? And if you get yourself like too removed from the actual kind of like the execution piece of it, I sometimes think that there can be a little bit of a passivity. On that note, you see, I write on my hands. Yeah, I saw that. No, yeah, yeah, you see, like, it yeah, looks very, really pro. Yeah, you, don't yeah. need a, you don't need a um, a piece of paper. What uh, would sod, that be for? Sod that. <laughs> uh, but but my, my question to you is, like, you said there about kind of, you don't want to be too far removed. We often hear the statement, hire great people and get out the way. How do yeah. you think about that? And then micromanagement and the balance between the two? It's... um. It goes back a little bit to sort of like, how do you lean into what you do really well? And so I think that there are aspects of a sort of ecosystem or a complicated company where you hire great people. And it's not that you get out of their way, but maybe you support them in a way where they feel empowered to do their job really well. And then there's the concept, I think, of you know, what is my responsibility, Harry, to like make a difference? You know, how do I become a difference maker player for my team? You know, and so how I try to do it is, you know, high level, like engage with, you know, the biggest, most important investors and engage with the biggest, most important clients. I think I'm really good at that. Um, And so I try to make a difference for my company by putting myself in those, you know, in those situations. Um, early on when I became CEO, I was invited nicely. I, I don't think they regret it now, but, but I was, it was a very nice invite from them to, um, be a part of the sort of JP Morgan, like CEO conference in Napa, um, quite a nice conference. And it was a nice invite. Um, you know, these CEOs from like all over the, all over the world were there and I got to watch, and this won't surprise you at all. I got to watch like Jamie in action. 
you know, as the CEO of, of JP Morgan, he's there, but like JP's hosting, you know, this event for their clients. Um, he's amazing with clients. Like you talk about a guy that can kind of flip the switch from, you know, he's the most well-regarded, esteemed person in a lot of ways at that event. He makes it all about his engagement with, you know, with JP Morgan's clients, his ego goes away. And every single one of his interactions is about like, how are you doing? What's going on in your business? How can we help you better? That was kind of like an interesting visual that I got. Like, I'm like, if he can be still that good at that, then we all have to kind of up our games a little bit because my goodness, like talk about like a difference maker, you know, that's like a big deal. You know, how many people like walked away from that conference? Like, yeah, the wine was great, but I got like 30 minutes with Jamie and he like really like understands my business now. Like that's kind of cool. Well, I think it goes back to the Maya Angelou quote. It's not what you say. It's not what you do. It's how you make someone feel. Yeah, I think that is true. Um, you know, the other thing she says, by the way, like, which I love, we're going to get into like a quote contest is like, <laughs> is like, you know, when people show you who they are, like believe them. Right. And so I've always kind of thought of that, which is like, you know, good and bad when people reveal themselves to you, like it's happening for a reason. OK, help me understand that. Do people not change, though? I look at myself and, you know, now I'm I'm not old, but I, you know, I've grown up quite a lot in the last 10 years. I did stupid shit. I used to lie when I was nervous. I would be too arrogant because I believed that bullshit. And now I realize that I'm just, you know, another person figuring life out. And so I don't know if that's fair. Do you know what I mean? Well, people grow for sure. And I think that's a very kind of um, sort of uh, intuitive comment that you're making. And I think as you grow, you show people your evolution. And so you don't just believe them once. I think maybe there's this concept of you're believing them all the time, but you're seeing who they are sort of, right? And so maybe there was a moment where you showed some someone one thing about yourself a long time ago, and now you have the ability to show someone something else about yourself. And if they're kind of evolved the right way, you know, they're seeing your growth along the way. Can I ask you a question? I mean, yeah, when we, we were chatting before and you were like, you know, preparing for the show and schedule, there's this kind of recurring theme in my management, which is that I very much dictate. There is no voice but mine and people are scared of me. Um, it's not great, actually. <laughs> I mean, my response is you should be. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, what would you advise me? I don't want to have a culture of fear. How do I not, but also be very direct, set the direction and, and lead? Um, you don't, you don't seem unbelievably scary, but I, but I hear you. Um, I think the most important thing is sort of since we're like sharing notes a little bit, I do think the most important thing is like being direct. I think that's really important. So if you're- Do you if sugarcoat? If I sugarcoat, it's like, if I could tell you like, you know, we all have things to work on. I either I sugarcoat or I have a little bit of this, like what's the thing like, you know, truth with Novocaine. Yeah. You know, I, I, I make it, I try to make it feel good sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not always like, like sort of like the most effective way. So we all have things to work on and I got to think through that, but like, it sounds to me like that directness that you're describing, um, is really, really good and really important. I think, I don't know, like as you get older, do you sometimes like sort of become a little bit, maybe more mellow? And no, I become, become I become less patient. But you're not, but you're not as older. You know, maybe maybe there's some sort of like moment where it flips a little bit. You know, I, I'm going to make you laugh with this. I'm I'm you know 54. Oh, you're not Billy. You yeah, look you know, so I'm, young. I'm 54, oh, going on 65. <laughs> um, I'm probably more intense in certain ways at 54 than I was at 34. Mm -hmm. Um. But I'm probably, I don't know, I guess I'm nicer now at 54 than I was at 34. I'm a little more, like, understanding of people, probably try to be. Do kids make you nicer? Is that it? Do they make you more patient, more understanding? 
Why yeah. Get nicer maybe, they, maybe, 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 maybe like being around love sort of when you leave the office in that kind of way, maybe mellows or kind of softens you. I think you can be pretty nice, but also like pretty exacting and pretty rigorous. And I think you can have very high expectations of people. So I can be nice. I can be a little bit, un unfortunately, like sometimes not quite as direct as I need to be. Everyone that works for me understands when, when I'm, when I'm angry, you know, I, I'm probably a, it's probably a bummer when I'm angry, you know, cause it maybe takes a little bit to get me angry or get me disappointed. Do you care about, word. do you care about being liked? Yeah. Hmm. Is, I is, do. That a we, is that a weakness? I can understand how people would perceive it as a weakness. Um, my overall instinct, Harry, is if, if you're authentic and you're yourself, then that's a lot of it all. Not to say that like no weaknesses can emerge, but you lead with who you are. Mm -hmm. So I've always, I think, probably wanted to be liked. I think I, I feel like getting along with people is like, let's like, let's start there. Um, I'm not easily pushed around. Um, and, 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 and so I, I tend, I mean, I'm going to make you laugh with this one. I don't always get what I want, but I tend to get what I want a fair amount. So I'm not a pushover, but if someone doesn't like me, does it bother me? Yeah. A little bit. When do you dictate versus when do you welcome opinion? This is another challenging one, which is like, no, no, no. I'm the CEO, we're going this way, versus open for thoughts, let's discuss the right plan together. I don't have like the perfect sort of blueprint on when I go in one direction versus when I go in a different direction. It's a little bit, honestly, of like some intuition. Mm. Um, I don't want to make it seem like the general that's always leading from the front in like the old war movies. But if I feel like it's a decision that ultimately... Um, there's a tremendous amount at stake around and there's going to be a fall guy on the decision. If it doesn't wind up working out, I will make sure to make an obvious point that it's mine. Yeah. Um, because I don't think you can pass the buck on big decisions. That being said, dude, I have a lot of smart people that work with me and, and I have a lot of really smart, by the way, like clients in my in my network, in my, in my world. So I do like to get people's opinions and I do like to hear from the people around me. And my general view is if you can get a consensus, like that's better. I get you. In venture, consensus often leads to, leads to a bit of a challenge. Uh, I, I do, you know, that's when it comes to decisions. And on decisions before, you've said about the importance of CEOs making kind of big bets, so to speak. Can you talk to me? Why is it so important that CEOs make big bets? And how do you think about them? You're not, it's like funny, I'm, I'm going to make you laugh for this. You're, you're by no means the first person that's like taken a phrase of mine and then like put it in like ink. So, so let me, let me, let me describe it for you this way for a second. So my company trade web has, you know, largely gotten to where we are today through a lot of like really good sort of, you know, organic investments and organic growth, right? So we are not some company that's arrived here through lots of like M and A, right? Um, but as you know, well, and you talked about like for yourself, like the sort of like the personal kind of evolution, the personal growth things, sometimes like companies need to grow through, I think change, you know? And so one of the things I've been doing a little bit um, is like using the language of change right? Which is like, we've gotten here and we've, we've arrived through all of this like organic kind of investment and growth and continuing to kind of move ourselves forward in this very one specific way. Let's start ta talking about like putting more bets on the table. Let's start talking about like doing more deals. And since we're going to talk about that and we're going to look in that direction, Let's talk about it like in big ways. Let's talk about it in like transformative ways. Let's not be afraid to sort of start using the language of like real ambition. Like why not? You know? And so it's a little bit, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering if you, um, if you play golf, I, I, I sometimes like play golf like too often and for sure, like not well enough. When you take a golf lesson, 
they'll like, they'll make a change and that change will feel so awkward because they're trying to get you to feel something, right? So sometimes you, well, I do this a lot. I, I will, I will um, enunciate a point pretty loudly to sort of push us in the direction of change. It totally makes sense. I think the biggest thing also with leaders is enunciating change. I always hear people say, oh, I'm so bored of saying the vision and the mission. And it's like, yeah, but for someone, it's the first time that they're hearing it. And you always have to remember that. You mentioned that, like, you know, how do you take bigger bets? How do you be more courageous, more bold? Super direct, Billy. Um, I think about talent brands a lot. Where do the best software engineers want to go to work? And with Stripe, with Shopify, with the Silicon Valley names, do the best software engineers want to go to trade web? And how do you think about that? Yeah, so I think in a, you're being, are you being like a, like, like polite maybe a little bit? Are you kind of saying like we're like a little too sleepy, a little too below the radar? Like, I, um, I'm saying like, how, how, do do we up the, how do we up the game kind of? Like how do we, how do you how do we get, get the, more of that recognition stuff? Yeah, so, we're, yeah. we're an incumbent. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the goal is for the answer to be yes. Is it yes? Like, we, you know, um, we have some work to do on sort of continuing to increase the the brand and the exposure of the company and that might that might um sort of play into effect in the way that you described around like recruiting not just with technologists but like with business people too um i think we've come a long way in in, in certain ways like the history of the company is kind of interesting because you don't always have companies that have been private for so long and then go public kind of later in the company's history or evolution. So like the roots of the company is really around being a little bit private. There are advantages um, to being sleepy sometimes. So, so, so I'll describe for you an advantage or maybe we can talk about this. Yeah. TradeWeb, Harry has a lot of clients, right? Goldman Sachs, like, you know, Morgan Stanley, PIMCO, Whamco, um, GSAM, the central banks, like, you know, Norgis, like all these big, like, you know, hedge funds, right? We sort of like travel along back and forth between like giant egos. You know, at the end of the day, it's really simple. Like we're the, you know, we're the, we're the electronic interface that connects like Citadel and Goldman. And so we've been pretty smart around understanding, like there's a totem pole. There's always been a totem pole. Understand where you sort of like live in that totem pole. And we don't always have to be the sort of like biggest ego in the room. We don't always have to have, you know, the biggest brand. We can kind of, you know, flourish and amplify a little bit sometimes behind the scenes and let our clients ultimately at the end of the day have the biggest, most important presence kind of out there. Um, I don't know if we've like always like thought that through like perfectly exactly. I think that's how we sort of evolved in a certain way. To your point, as a, as a public company, I think like increasing brand is important. That's it's like not the only reason why I'm doing this, but like, as you can tell, it's a concerted effort on our part to like increase, you know, exposure. Um, I think the more people learn about and understand and hear about our company, the better off we are. We have a good story to tell. It's fascinating in terms of the strategic positioning of kind of knowing where one sits and also being the enabler means that you don't always have to be front of house. You know, um, dude, one time, I was out with a guy, this is like a long time ago, with, uh, he, was a, he was a nice guy, he was a little bit of like out of central casting, um, sort of, uh, you know, hard nosed like Bond guy, you know, um, at, this is like probably like 10 years ago. And he was at, uh, he was working at, at Credit Suisse at the time. And we were talking and I kept referring to, you know, BlackRock, you know, as my client. And he just reminded me in a really nice way. He's like, oh, yeah, like they're actually like my client sort of. Right. And, and I didn't want to get into a debate with him about like who, who actually was providing more value to BlackRock or who BlackRock was more of the client to. But he was letting me just understand like, hey, look, I'm going to say this in a nice way. 
you know, there's no way that relationship with BlackRock is more important to you than it is to me. Human beings are very like interesting, right? Because there's like so quickly almost like, I don't want to say like a competitive dynamic, but people have like egos, dude, like big egos. Do you, do you have an ego? You have to, I mean, I have an ego. You have to have an ego. And I would, you know, I'm an, I'm a, um, I'm a person that was, you know, president of my company, the number two person in my company, you know, for a long time, great working relationship and a friendship and a partnership with the CEO, you know, and we would talk about it where I would say to him, like, you know, this can't be cold play where like, you know, everyone knows like Chris Martin and like no one else, like this has to be, you know, a, a band where, it, you know, at least there's two of us Why? that we know. Why, why is because that? my ego, I, was, I guess my ego was bruised. You know, I was like, oh, wait, I don't want to be, you know, Mike Pence, like standing in, you know, standing in the back, you know. <laughs> what, did he, what did he say? He said, I got you. I hear you. You know, and that's why we will kind of, um, you know, you know, co-brand. We'll work on making sure that it's always understood that this is a, you know, really, you know, a two man partnership at the time. That being said, he was the boss, you know, he was the CEO, you know, so there were certain things he would do by definition that I would be, you know, the person kind of standing, you know, on the sides. And I felt my ego then like, Oh, what, what would it be like to do that myself? Kind of. Right. And so of course, how was it when you became Freddie Mercury or Chris Martin? It was comfortable. And normal, and it felt um, it felt um, sort of like a, like a, a process that had kind of worked. And for me, it felt like a moment in time, maybe maybe like in my life and career, where I was for sure like ready to do it. Which is like a big part of I think like when succession works the right way, and a big part of the process of of ultimately running a public company. But it did not feel honestly. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, very well that I would kind of tell you if it was true, it did not feel like laden with like anxiety. Huh. It felt like, <laughs> let's go, let's go do this. Um, I've done a lot in my career and I'm ready for like this next chapter. Was there ever a time where you had to check yourself on your ego? I remember when I was like 21 and I made, you know, made like a certain amount of money and I was like, I am fucking cool. <laughs> and, and I believe the bullshit too much. Maybe when professionally it has not felt um challenging for me to do that because i think there's like a a little bit of like an easygoingness that i bring to the equation that feels less ego driven so what i think about is like um how do you make sure that your casualness does not allow a scenario where someone thinks the results are casual Right. So I, I'm, I'm aware of all of that stuff. Do you worry about that? Cause yeah, you are, because yeah. you are informal and human and it's wonderful for yeah, me. But, I do. Yeah, I do. Because like, like I said to you, I'm more driven now than I was when I was building my career, but I don't always show it. Right. So for me, my, my, I, um, I wouldn't say it's like a technique, because it's like, it's my personality and it's who I am. Um, I'm comfortable in my own skin and I, I, um, I come across that way. I'm also, again, let's throw this other thing back in the mix. Like, I think like firmly aware of like this totem pole thing. I don't know, like, like when someone takes themselves like so seriously, it's like, come on guys, like, let's remember, um, you know, there are bigger problems in the world. There are bigger problems in the, in the, you know, in the financial service industry. Like, you know, we don't have to all, what was the thing with, um, I'm going to make you laugh when, um, the famous line, when, you know, the financial crisis was kind of roaring and the story was, was that like Lloyd was, you know, in a, in a town car headed down to see the fed and kind of one of the bankers in the car said to him, like, I don't, you know, I don't know how much more I can kind of take of this because they were stressed. They were working really hard. Like everyone was going like, you know, a hundred miles an hour. And I think the guy was like, you know, I don't know how much more I can take all this. It's like the pressure's like, you know, building. And Lloyd kind of said like, come on, like we're not like, you know, storming the, you know, the beach at Normandy, 
right? Like, let's keep this all in perspective. Like, you know, <laughs> we're all pretty you, lucky here. Like, it's feel, all okay. Do you feel the pressure? You know, a little bit of a, of a concept of what you're saying in terms of ego. I sometimes feel the pressure when I go home, you know, and I, and I, and I find myself like slightly having a harder time to um, relax and unwind and be present with my family. Um, and I feel like distracted. And so I'm thinking to myself, like, why am I carrying all this stuff home? It must be maybe because of like how I'm, how I'm, um, dealing with pressure, maybe how pressure is kind of running through my system. I don't feel like someone asked me, like, do I feel nervous? And I don't feel nervous. So, so if I'm doing, well, you make everyone feel very comfortable. So I wouldn't feel nervous in this situation. If I was doing like CNBC, I wouldn't feel nervous. Um, if I'm doing an earnings call, I won't feel nervous. You know, maybe that's like, everything's going well, um, <laughs> that helps. But sometimes when I'm doing a, a, a part of, and I'll wind up having a bunch of board members probably watch this. Sometimes when I'm doing a part of a, of a board meeting that isn't necessarily out of my central casting sort of comfort zone, I'll feel a little nerves. You know, like, oh, I'm in 10th grade. I'm going in to take a biology test. You know, have I studied hard enough? What? Most I likely never, not. I never studied. And second, I probably was you know, absent for the test itself. I realize it's better not to show up than take it and get a yeah. D. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I totally get that. I, I, I do have to ask, on the, like, you feel the pressure when you go home. I don't. I feel the guilt. And that means because I'm like, relatively uninterested by the conversation you spend all day stimulated your, with your, your brain's tired yeah but then they want to talk about the weather your brain's and... tired yeah yeah I and mean, i feel that too it's like um it's a challenge it's it's like something's not quite right if at the end of the day you know i haven't figured out a way to kind of keep that engagement thing kind of running and maybe it's like run out of gas a little bit. And I feel that way too, where it's sort of like, how can I um, be unbelievably aware of like these five, sort of the details of these five business issues, but struggle with my, you know, you know, my 12th graders, um, the name of her history teacher. You know, do, you feel, my, do, you, do you feel like you've been there for your kids like you would like to have been? It's really hard when you're CEO of a public company. I miss, you know, the, the the broad answer and it's a, it's a really it's a genuine question um the broad answer is definitely yes the 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 truthful and the more more recent answer is no so like this year my 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 i have um i have three kids and my my um my middle my younger daughter um she, she's a senior you know senior in high school and she's got like all these like big basketball games you know, it's her last basketball games um, of her, probably like of her life. And I missed a bunch of them, you know, cause I was working and I, and I felt like the work was really important and I relied on my relationship with her that she would be understanding of it. And of course she was, but I feel the loss of, of missing those moments the most, I think. Did you really need to be there? In terms of for the work, like often we can over amplify the importance of it. And it's like, mm, no one will remember those in a year. Good question. Is that like pressure? Is that how pressure kind of seeps into your system where you kind of like overwork in a certain way because you feel pressure? Maybe it's possible. Like I'll never know really. I think it's impossible to know the answer of like, was it worth it? If, if you're asking me today, my answer is like, probably not. But at the time, I must have thought, yes, that that might be pressure. Has your style of parenting changed over the years, Billy? No. I mean, I think I was like, um, you know, I, I think I was always um, probably a little bit of like, a, I don't want to say like the, 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 the yes dad, but but maybe I was I was um, I struggled saying no. I love my kids. So it was easy to kind of, um, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, surround them with, 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 with love and to try to be the person that did a lot of fun things with them. And I find myself doing, you know, different, obviously versions of that. 
but being kind of similar along those things, you know, 15 years later or 20 years later, that that sort of dynamic is kind of still in place. How do you inspire children to have the same hunger, ambition, tenacity when they're brought up in a, a wealthy family, bluntly? You know, you went to a betting shop in the Bronx. Yeah. Like, they don't need to. Right. <laughs> How do you encourage them to be really hard. ambitious? Super hard. I would say that, like, from a parenting perspective, you know, that's, like, the number one thing on my mind. Um, I think... I think there's a difference between sort of having, I don't know, what are we talking about? Like privilege, mm -hmm. like having access to privilege or maybe being privileged. And I think that's like a, it's like an interesting word these days and being like, um, spoiled, you know, and being, um, unmotivated, you know, and, and, and so I learned a long time ago, sort of a little bit of a lesson, which is like, other people's successes like aren't your success. And I've also kind of learned a lot around the concept of like, I'll make you laugh with this one. It's sort of, um, you know, the beer's not as cold when it's like not yours, you know? So there's a really nice feeling to go into like your house, you know, with your cold beer in your house and having a sip of that and knowing like, hey, like I, I kind of earn that, you know? And so I really, you know, I, I, I go out of my way and, you know, in the best possible way as a father, just to kind of reiterate, you know, those kinds of things with my kids. Um, but yeah, they live a different life than I did. I often ask myself, would I work as hard if I've been brought up in different situations? And the honest answer is I don't fucking know. You, Maybe you, you can't, right? It's, it's like hard to know. Like what's that little like extra motivational thing? You know, I went to schools. I grew up like, you know, pretty, you know, you know, Manhattan, like middle class. Um, but I, you know, I went to schools with like a bunch of, you know, you know, friends, um, but much more, much more wealthy, um, you know, friends than I was as a kid, I was motivated, you know, not necessarily by like money or status or all that stuff, but I, I, I was for sure motivated to prove myself. And that, as you know, very well, that can be like a super strong blessing. Money, fame, power. How do you rank the three in what's important to you? Fame, distant third. <laughs> um, it would be really easy to say like, you know, like money first, power second. But I think, um, I think power is like pretty interesting. So I think if you dismiss power, so, so obviously maybe you're not quite being, being super, super true or super assessing like how you really feel. Um, I kind of, I've, I've always sort of thought like a little bit of like prospering kind of below the radar is not a terrible place to be. You know, you're going to blow up my Instagram account with this one. Um, so I'm going to become less, less below the radar at some point, but, but like, I think like, you know, prospering below the radar is kind of cool. One thing I often think about is like, do richer leaders make better leaders? And the reason I say that is because you remove downside fear. You can be more courageous when downside is relatively removed and you don't need to constantly be fearful like one is if they are not financially independent or free. Do you think richer leaders make better leaders? Not 100% positive. It's a good way to kind of think about it. I would say there's certainly examples where that seems to be kind of true, right? If you think about like, you know, a lot of these sort of like private equity um you know, founders or hedge fund founders who are, you know, extraordinarily wealthy, who have become sort of almost sort of wise people in certain ways around like, you know, I think really important kind of traits. The opposite way to think about it would be like, are they, you know, by not having as much at stake, do they lose some cre credibility? It doesn't seem like it. No, because the, the best are like I, I, machines. Like they're just animals and the money is just like a scoreboard where it's just like beating the other fucker on the other side of the table. And it's just a way to show that you win. You know this really well, Harry Blackstone at one point was a, was a, um, 
was a majority shareholder in my in in my company, and um, there was a moment in time before we went um, before the company went public where I wound up kind of like very casually, um, and they they've been a great firm to work with. I I, I wound up very casually meeting Steve Schwartzman in a, in a casual kind of setting, you know, speaking of kind of like you're almost describing him kind of perfectly. And it was very quick. And he would like to say he would never remember it is a understatement. He kind of grabbed me a little bit by the arm and he said like, you know, very aware that, you know, the Blackstone role in the company and the fact that my company was going public. And he kind of said, you know, as a, as a sort of wise man, like it, it's nice to win, enjoy it. And I felt that when he said it, I was like, well, this guy knows like winning, <laughs> you know? And if he's telling me like to not lose sight of that moment where you've worked really hard for something and it's happening or it's coming true, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of like, like remember this moment for sure knowing he's not, but I'm, but I'm going to remember this moment because like he knows, you know? And so maybe in that model that you're describing, like those guys like know like what it takes, you know, you might as well listen. Do you like being public company? Honestly, I think it looks fucking horrible. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> and I have so many friends who are public company CEOs now. Yeah. I'm like, do you like him? They're like, no, I hate it. I wish. Yeah. I mean, when you said honestly, like you're you're kind of leading the witness. Um, there are anyone would say there are things about it not to like. Like what? Right. Um, you wind up spending a lot of your time on um, corporate governance, regulation, things that you feel like are are um, occupying more of your time than you wish they could. And almost everyone kind of feels that way a little bit, like burdened by the structure of it. That being said, there are, you know, just genuinely, there's a, like a lot of things to also like about it. Are, are you and I doing this um, today if we weren't public? Maybe. I mean, maybe the company's got enough profile and we know enough people and Rana's amazing that she's connecting us no matter what, but are you as interested in doing it? Maybe not. So there's a profile thing kind of that works. There's a, you know, this is going to make you laugh because I told you I was like a pretty, um, you know, poor student in a lot of different ways. There's like that report card thing around like, how is your company like ultimately performing in the bright lights of a stock price? Do you check that daily? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like a, okay. So like I tie my mental happiness and my mental state to the performance of my company. Yeah. It's kind of harder for me because there's no ticker. Um, yeah. But I'm down when my company's down. How do you not get depressed when your ticker's down? And how do you detach from the performance of the company? I think it's, it's sort of like, um, it's hard. And it's sort of like, um, is it, it you know, is it is it down because the market's getting repriced around, you know, an extra genius event and like it's not personal? Or is it down because there's been some sort of like subpar performance in your business and the market's reacting to subpar performance? So I do think you can kind of kilter your reaction differently. I think when it's like, you know, it's not that, you know, we've been lucky because we've performed like really, really well, um, but it's not like we've performed perfectly. So you wear those moments where maybe, you know, you feel like there's been a reaction, uh, you know, a negative reaction to your business um, and you're human. Can I ask you, what's been the biggest bet that you've made as CEO that's worked out on the first front? And what did you learn from that? We've done, you know, a couple of, of, of important deals that have been not big bets, but they've been kind of smaller bets that are moving us in the direction of kind of what you and I are talking about in terms of like the big bets. Can I push you, Billy? Really? I, I really like this in you. If there's not a big bet that comes to mind straight away, respectfully, and I'm so pushing, do yeah. you think you've been courageous enough as CEO making big bets? So I almost was finished, but you caught me like kind of like, in a, in a, cause I, I, I do these like super like long run on sentences, as you know, I placed big bets on people 
in my in in, in my tenure as CEO, and I'm not kind of like sugarcoat the answer. Like I really have. What does that mean? You bet on people who don't have the qualifications and the experience, but you believe you. What is placing a big bet on a person? I've brought people into my world who I took took a, a bet on. I sort of like I want it to work out, and I've 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 invested, and I've um, you know co-created relationships that have worked. And by the way, that can be people I've hired, that can be board members that have entered my world. It can come from kind of like different directions, but I have taken sort of what 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 I would describe to you as like, honestly, like risks in sort of relationships um, that I felt like were sort of beneficial to both me and the company, you know, and some people kind of like, when we talk about like a bet, you can talk about it or think about it in a couple of different ways. Some people are like, oh no, like, like we're just gonna like stick to knitting. We're not gonna bring people in. I'm not gonna be sort of open to sort of different voices in a boardroom and all of that stuff. And I've, I think benefited from having very strong intuition about people and ultimately putting a bet on the, the, the you know, the partnership that exists in, in, a, in a business relationship. If you were to put a number on it, what percent of your bets on people prove outright? Shockingly, because I feel like I'm really damn good at that stuff. Not as high as you would think. Well, there's a trope, and so you can put a number on it for me after this, but there's a trope that basically 50% of the time yeah. will work out. I was going to say 50 you know, and I and I'm like, man, like if I'm filling out like a like a survey or um, a form, and I'm listing my strengths, I'd like, oh, like the way I think about things, the way I get to know people, like that the kind of antenna thing that we were talking about, like the concept of being able to have like intuition, all of those things should be like bright lights pointing towards like seventy five percent or like like a hundred percent, like everyone, but like the answer is no. No, listen, to I'm totally with you. I'm terrible at it bluntly. <laughs> um, so, but in the 50% that don't, are there commonalities in why it doesn't work out? Maybe chemistry, huh. you know, maybe I saw something in them that they didn't quite have, or I pushed them in a direction that maybe they didn't quite want to go to. And then maybe in like the human nature of the whole thing that, the chemistry broke down and you sometimes you get stuck and then it's kind of like, you know, can you, can you sort of get unstuck? You know, can you find another kind of run at this whole thing? Um, you know, and I've had to sort of like assess like a little bit of, 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 of the very first kind of things that you and I were talking about. And this is turning into like an amazing um, therapist session, which is, you know, have I been clear enough? Have I been direct enough? Have I given enough kind of feedback along the way? Most of the time, the answer is yes. And I don't like put a lot of blame for myself when something doesn't work out. But as you know really well, like there's always like a sort of like a co-created dynamic. And and when you're CEO and you and you place a bet on someone and it doesn't work, you know, you're bummed. Oh, yeah. Uh, and and then there's time delays and there's lags and then yeah. you have to go through the process of getting rid of them and then the process of finding someone new and then onboarding is three steps getting rid new yeah, all so, painful but shit, all bad outcomes all, all long processes how quickly do you know if a bet on a person is a bad bet it can really depend and then there are these moments where you know truthfully like someone clearly kind of turns it around and that initial instinct can be wrong. As someone was telling me recently, you know, the first time a CEO feels like, you know, something hasn't worked out, they should act on it. Because like, if they have that impulse with like, you know, all of the sort of importance on the line, um, there's a reason why they're having that impulse. And um, it's going to be tough to kind of ultimately resurrect the relationship. I don't, I, I have not found that to be the case as we're kind of talking about this, like, I, and I don't feel like this is a defect. I feel like this is a, um, an absolute strength. I'm an optimist and I really see qualities in people. And, and sometimes it's a struggle of like, Hey, I see this in you. 
you can do better here. I'm going to keep pushing you because I know you have it in you. But I'm demanding of it, by the way. Like, this isn't like for a forever chance, but it's there. I'm going to get in trouble for this one. But I, you said I'm pushing you and demanding. I am the same, but I think that the younger generation, which I am in, uh, are entitled and do not want to work as hard and want to prioritize balance and life. And I think it's very challenging to have the same work environment that you had in the 80s yeah. and 90s, which was fucking grind. Yeah. Like, yeah, like people yeah. like smoking on desks. Yeah, and people used to pull <laughs> all-nighters in banks. Yeah. Often. Yeah, like 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 a really tough sort of like there was a it was a tough culture. There's yeah. like, there's like no doubt about that. But it but it was actually an efficient culture in many ways yeah. in terms of output. Yeah. Do you do you worry that this generation is too soft? Some of that stuff got played out a lot around as you know really well like around COVID and work from home and there felt like there was like if not a power struggle, there felt like there was this like tension in the system about like you know, what's really going to work here, you know? And I don't want to sound like, you know, the old guy on a ch on the chair on a lawn kind of thing, like making, you know, making pronouncements about like what the kids are like these days. But sometimes, you know, like it's sort of like there's so much benefit that you get from like hustle and grit and perseverance there's just is i will say this and tell me what you think about this like the the kids that have it like switched on like wow do they have like um a lot of like trajectory in front of them oh 100 percent. but you i know. but i also find with the ones that have it switched on they show early signs of exceptionalism it's why whether i'm hiring you or i'm investing in you i will always go back to your early childhood no great mm. person who was hugely ambitious fell out of mckinsey and bain and thought oh now i'm going to be really ambitious and courageous it's a, it's a process along the way some of that process can be about sort of positive momentum so i know people who have only been successful and they will only be successful. And they were successful when they were in sixth grade. They were successful when they were sophomores in high school. They went to Harvard. They went to Harvard Business School and they've been exceptionally successful straight out of central casting in their professional careers. All of that is like positive momentum that has just built over time. There's a I would, reason why I, that I would is. never hire them. Yeah. Or, or invest in them. Those guys are the ones that break the minute something breaks. They never, ever have experienced being bullied, being the fat kid in the corner with no friends. Yeah. The, the, the sort of like the, the sort of like Tom Brady theory of like, I'm going to use every slight in the, in the, that's ever existed to continually motivate myself and create this kind of resilience thing. There's, 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 there's like no doubt that that's, the sort of like the two types. I don't know, but I would never, I mean, I, you know, so, so, so you and I were kind of like joking about, you know, the kind of EQ thing and like the, the sort of like self-awareness and all of that stuff. Like I sometimes gravitate, gravitate towards people like who aren't like me at all. And when I say that to make you laugh, like the out of central casting, like the smartest people like in the room. Like the, 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 like I've always been the smartest. I will always be the smartest. And that switch, that cognitive switch is just like turned on. I am really attracted to, and I am, um, I see the benefits, you know, of just like, of just like straightforward, like, wow, like a really, really smart person. Oh no, no, I don't like them too smart. Very bad, very bad trait. That, that's, you know. There's right. a there's a decent chance that you're a very smart guy. <laughs> it's also a decent for me. It's easy. Yeah, there's a decent chance that I'm a charmer and I'm a sales <laughs> guy. Uh, but no, I okay. I would rather unwavering hustle than I would unwavering. Yes. Smart. Well, listen, you know, you get both, and then you're really onto something. Like, let's be honest, right? You get both, and I I I've been with you on the side of like, 
you know, hustle and, 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 and resiliency and really what we're talking about are like offset skills. The hardest thing, the thing that I'm, I've made mistakes on now, which is I used to hire the pedigreed person from amazing and that was the wrong hire. And then I went black from like, you know, binary and I would suddenly go to the really inexperienced, really hungry, ambitious. And that didn't work either. It was not, it was just inexperienced and immature. Yeah. And it's, so well, it's like finding you know, you know what, you know, what's interesting, like in my world, Harry, and you'll, you'll, you're going to appreciate this, like, you know, to make an obvious point and I'll, and I'll, I'll mangle this for you. There were a ton of really bad consequences to a firm, um, you know, to a firm like Bear Stearns going through like the struggles that Bear Stearns went through, you know, one of those is that, you know, when I grew up like in the bond trading world where, you know, Bear Stearns had like tremendous levels of respect, right? And really talented people. And they like lived in that ethos of what you're describing. Like, it's not about pedigree. It's not about polishedness. It's not about like, you know, where you, what school you came from and who you know. It's about like old fashioned grit and resiliency and street smarts and that entire firm for a lot of years. And even when that firm was like extremely successful for a lot of years, kind of lived by that code. To see that code kind of die by the sword a little bit hurt, you know, because, because it was kind of cool to kind of feel that culture in the world. A lot of younger people look at where we are today and feel very worried about the state of the economy, the state of yeah. the world. You've seen some real, oh shit moments. Yeah. How does this compare? And how did it feel when Bear Stearns went through its troubles, Lehman's went through its troubles, 2008 happened? You and I will talk more. This is not, this is not our first conversation. You know, um, you know, my company was on the 51st floor of the North Tower. I was in the building on 9-11 that day. So, you know, when I think about like trauma, you know, it kind of starts with kind of 9-11. Um, and then I think about like the sort of like professional trauma around the around the crisis. Um, and that was some pretty scary stuff. You know, is there going to be cash, you know, at the ATM at City at Citibank? Like it, it, it was, you know, there was this like just like massive unwind and it, it can feel like that never happened. But it did. And so for like a company like TradeWeb, like we saw like our clients like, you know, with this like amazing business model and then saw our clients going down one by one by one, you know, and, and there was a moment where, you know, and Ted Pick as CEO at Morgan Stanley, he's talked about it. There was a moment where Morgan Stanley felt like, you know, next in line, like super shaky, right? Like, where can this thing go? And then, you know, cut, you know, cut more, you know, more recently, um, you know, even a year ago, like the shocks to the system around the regional banks and all of that, you, you, you realize you're living in this like fragile, kind of fragile, um, you know, place. And, you know, and I didn't even mention, obviously, you know, the pandemic, the world feels like obviously like scary right now. But does this feel better than it did then in 2008, in 2000 with the dot com? the markets feel better and more resilient and in sort of like in an obvious way in better shape. There's a playbook in place around sort of preserving the structure and the, and the, and the high functioningness of the market in a way that should people should feel sort of, I think in a good way, um, confident in the world feels like shakier than ever. I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong about that, but I see, not a ton of good things out there if you start with like American politics and then get into the Middle East and then get into kind of Russia and then we haven't you know I'm not a I'm not a political expert but everything even around China feels pretty fragile so that's or pretty volatile so that that's like that has to keep us all all up at night does geopolitics impact your business yeah you know just from the from the, from the standpoint of like volatility in the marketplace um, you know, we've gotten much stronger in the, in the EM regions. And so we've, you know, we've gone through periods of time where we've planted flags in terms of like how we've wanted to build business in like 
China markets and things like that. So there's always like a little bit of like a real world impact to what we do. I want to do a quick fire with you. So what have you changed your mind on in the last 12 months most? I have changed my mind on on Trump being electable. 12 months ago, I didn't think the guy, I, I did not think the Republican Party would get behind him and I didn't think he could win the election. And now you think he will. I'm unwavering in the fact that I think he will. I, I think he will. And I, you know, it starts with he can, but I think it ends with he will. Is it that bad if he does? I mean, I think it's bad for like, you know, my nervous system. Um, but like he was right about China. Uh, he was right about a lot of the economy. I mean, COVID really was you know you and i can talk about like what he was right about and wrong about from you know he brings so much kind of negative energy into the into all the situations but you know we we can probably have a thoughtful conversation about like things that he got right i mean i think we're allowed to do that i find kamala harris brings so much positive energy to the situation billy you're right (laughs) (laughs) no comment yeah Uh, what do you okay is new york city still the capital of the world Yeah. New York City is, you talk about resiliency, you talk about grit, you talk about, um, you know, all of those qualities that make someone kind of awesome. New York City has like all that stuff, like times a million. What's the best book on financial markets and why? The best book on financial markets is going to surprise you. Reread all of the financial part of Sherman McCoy in bonfire of the vanities the way tom wolf is able to kind of get inside um you know a trading firm that was sort of modeled after solomon brothers um is incredible like the language that he describes like transactions and the cadence of the markets off the charts what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started as ceo you can call yourself the night before your first day as ceo and say ah billy you should know this create boundaries quickly so 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 don't always entertain sort of um every new relationship which can be a concept of like a banking relationship it can be um an external relationship with a client like preserve your time at a, at a, in a, in a very very structured way because time is sort of was one of the most valuable things that you have um, and be very, very diligent about your time is what I would say. That's a good one. So many people say to me, I wish I wasn't as nervous and I wish I'd known that it would all be okay. And I think it's (laughs) the most bullshit one because the fact that you worry that it won't be okay means you work harder. You put in more hours. If you would always know that it's okay, I probably wouldn't have worked hard. By the way. Fine. Won't bother. Won't bother fundraising. Why would I do that? Yeah. Um, uh, You can have dinner with anyone, dead or alive. Who do you have dinner with and why? My, My, um... My father passed away when I was younger, so I would definitely always kind of like pick him. Um, if I were... How old were you when he passed away? I was 26. So if I could pick him, you know, like have a fun sushi dinner with him, I think I would probably pick him. I'm so sorry to be passing. Does, does it upset you that he doesn't see your success? I, I don't think about it like constantly, but the answer has to be kind of like deep down... You know, yes. And so you live with sort of like a bunch of regrets sometimes. And that has to be one of them because, you know, you feel that, but you also sort of like regret that he didn't get a chance to spend time, you know, with my, you know, as a grandfather. Hmm. So that's, that's, that's the, that's the, you know, the part of life that gets tough. Penultimate one. What are you most excited about or optimistic about today? We just spoke about geopolitics and global conflict and the challenges. What are you most excited or optimistic about? I'll kind of answer this one like a little bit like personally, like I'm, I'm really um, sort of optimistic and excited both about like where I feel like this company is going to go And then not to be not to be like narcissistic, but to be honest, you know, my own personal kind of evolution and growth and how I I feel like um, I can continue to um, lead and run this company. I'm like, I'm very, very enthused. And I think this comes through to you and excited about um, the opportunities in front of 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 the company and myself personally. Okay, that's that's a great lead on to the final one, which is like 10 years time. Where do you think you will be as a company? And as an addendum to that, 
What is the one reason why you would not achieve that? The company is going to continue to be this like high powered kind of global marketplace that's going to continue to march in all of these um, new directions, some of which will we, we, you and I could plot out right now and some of which we haven't thought of. But when you think about the concept of this company's ability to partner with the most important market participants, there's nothing stopping sort of a forward march for us. So we're going to be bigger, stronger, and a better company. Complacency is the, is the killer of the whole thing. You know, dude, like um, getting, getting the things that matter wrong is the killer. You stop placing like, you know, idea generation at the top. You start putting like, you know, office politics ahead of that. Like, mm, you lose sight of like who the customer is. Bad traits, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very determined and, and I'm going to work my best to make sure like those things don't kind of enter our world, but those are the killers. Billy, I've so enjoyed this. Uh, I know it, it turned too. into a bit of a therapy session, which I love. It's always a well, sign of a great for me, for sure. I'm a, you're going to send me a bill. Uh, no, I'm not actually. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I greatly appreciate the flexibility. This is why schedules yeah. are shit. Thank you so much for being so brilliant. My pleasure. And thanks to Ron and thanks to you. This was great.